Hello friends and welcome back to my channel, Blue Nose Trading. My name is Tori Solis and today I'm working on a special collaboration project. I reached out to Evan Pardue, host of Little Things for Bonsai People podcast and the manager of Underhill Bonsai in Louisiana to collaborate on this project. Basically, I asked if he would be willing to collaborate on a weird bonsai art project with an off-the-wall pot. All I told him was that I was designing a weird, non-traditional pot that was to be inspired by the swamps of Louisiana. Most thankfully, he agreed to plant a cool tree in whatever pot I sent, so here we are, making the pot. I'm working with my favorite clay, Spectacular, from Trinity Ceramic in Dallas. This is a warm buff clay with pepper speckles. It reminds me of sand, creek beds, and gravel roads. This pot is going to be something different than my normal wheel thrown work, as in this is not going to be a round pot. I rolled a slab for the base of this pot at my friend's studio in Dallas. I still don't have my own slab roller, but man do I need to get one. A slab roller is essential if y'all want me to keep making oval and irregular pots. I just do not have the time or patience to roll out these slabs with a rolling pin. I just don't, guys. My hat's off to all of y'all out there rolling slabs by hand, but it ain't for me, dog. If you'd like to help out the cause, there's a link in the video description where you can find my web store and my Patreon. Both of those links are great ways to show love and support and to help the show grow. The walls for this pot were thrown on the wheel. Because the bottom of the pot is going to be a slab, I threw the walls without a bottom. I threw the walls on a plaster hydro bat, so there was some sticking to the bottom as I pulled out the walls. On a plastic bat, this is a lot easier to throw the walls without leaving so much clay in the center. If you're curious about the different kind of bats potters throw with, check out my super neat video here. Putting this pot together was a dance with timing. The slab and the walls both have to dry to a point of similar dryness. The walls need to be flexible enough to shape, but firm enough not to be floppy when I pick them up off the bat. The slab base needs to be firm enough that when I flip over the pot, the slab isn't going to sink in the middle. It took a lot of well-timed poking and prodding to get the timing just right. Not to mention a lot of carefully placed plaster and plastic wrap. For the shape of this pot, I went with something completely organic and irregular. The choices for making the shape were entirely unplanned, intuitive decisions made in the moment. Sometimes I have a plan, but most of the time the plan is very loose. I usually have a general idea more than an exact blueprint of a plan in my mind. I like to leave doors open for the universe to whisper in the moment guidance on projects like this. Plans take me to the future. I like to make my work in the conscious present, and that's the space at the moment that I'm in, when I'm in it. I think this shape would make a really cool guitar body. The pot is going to be attached with my usual method of scoring the connection and applying a slip to act as a glue to hold the join. After making the connection, I of course have to refine and fuss with the interior and the exterior and generally rework how the seam looks and feels. To make the inner edges of the pot smooth, I rolled out some small soft coils to work into the grooves. Using these coils, I was able to make a lovely inner seam. I added some clay to a few places on the outside as well. I was just evening things out before I go in and completely reshape the bottom of the pot. This pot is going to dry for a little bit longer before it's going to be able to be flipped over. Before I wrap it up to dry it a bit longer though, I'm going to go ahead and put the drainage holes in. For this pot, I'm going to put two large holes near the center on both sides and an assortment of smaller holes. The smaller holes are options for running tie down wires as well as additional drainage to keep. After a couple more days sitting on plaster and wrapped in plastic, the pot is ready to flip. The plaster helps the bottom of the pot stiffen up a bit more in an even way and the plastic wrap keeps the walls from drying out too quickly. I needed the clay to be just the right leather consistency to be able to refine the bottom, apply the feet, and later apply the sculpture. To refine the bottom, I'm going to use a metal rib to remove clay and reshape the bottom. I'm then going to come in with a Mud Tools red rubber rib to compress and smooth out the surface. A back and forth with these two tools gets me gradually to the place of refinement that I'm looking for. When the bottom edges are where I want them, I'm going to stamp my signature into the pot. It's good to get this done while I have it flipped over. Once this pot has a sculpture on it, it won't get flipped over again until after the bisque fire. 
Not being able to flip over my work while it dries has created unique challenges for my process. To overcome uneven drying, these sculptural pieces have to be dried extra slowly, wrapped in plastic wrap on a shelf for several weeks. For this pot, I'm giving it slight feet. I don't want it to sit too tall, but I also want there to be room underneath for the drainage holes to work properly, as well as for the tie-down wires to have room to do their job. In general, both of these considerations are high on my priority list as far as craft and function. I make a lot of weird pots and bend a lot of aesthetic and design choice rules, but the pot has to be functional. I prefer simple, organic feet for my bonsai pots. In general, I enjoy a pot with an organic feel all around. I find that the organic texture and feeling really show the artist's hands in the work. People are imperfect and imperfections, as they may sometimes be called, don't really feel like an issue to me in most cases, they just feel human. A slight bump, sag, dink, warp, dimple, that's all just part of the process and what comes from human hands. I would also like to clarify that care, attention, and craft are always important. At the baseline, you still need to know how to work with clay and understand the ceramic medium. I don't think we should try to pass off not knowing how clay works as organic. It's hard to define, but I think it comes down to intention and craftsmanship. Something can be well built, beautiful, and still imperfect when compared to something that's been cast in a mold. But that imperfection is what sets the organic tone for the work and sets it apart from work made in a mold. The technical side and techniques to make pots that are straight, smooth, and unmarred are also a great way to make pots and a really respectable approach. I like those kind of pots too. I just think there's room for both organic whimsy and systematic structure in the world of art and pots. Two ways of being, a yin and a yang if you will. I knew that I wanted this pot to have a sculpture. It also didn't take me long to decide that that sculpture would be an American alligator. They are the quintessential example of Delta Swamp wildlife. I lived in Florida for several years and I was always impressed with the alligators. They're very majestic creatures and they definitely deserve our respect. Although most memories I have of alligators, they were just big chillin. I'm hoping to carry that big chilling posture into the mood of the sculpture. I really like the idea of an alligator because it would be in the same vein as my previous dragon sculpture pots, but with a unique twist. If anything, alligators are real life dragons of today, and this is just as much of a dragon pot as any other that I've made. Getting the teeth and the spikes on the back just right took most of the time while making this pot. I tend to be one to fuss with the sculpture a lot. I want to get it just so. Sometimes I'm not even sure what the right look is. I only know that it's wrong until it isn't, and that leads to a lot of fussing with it. My favorite tools for this kind of work are dental tools and cheap paintbrushes. If you sculpt with any kind of clay, I highly recommend that you get yourself of dental cleaning tools. They're excellent for detailing. I mean, when you think about it, dentists are basically tool sculptors when they go in there to shape things up, so it makes sense that the tools would translate well. Once the sculpture was done, I determined that this pot needed some sort of texture. I wanted to add a texture that gave this alligator a sense of place. I decided to carve in some grassy foliage mixed with shrubby foliage to represent a swampy waterside undergrowth. With the right tree or trees, I'm hoping this pot can come together in a very cool swampy composition. Maybe something with some Scooby Doo vibes, but I really don't want to put any huge expectations or anything on it, I just want it to be. I love me a wetlands biome. I had the opportunity to experience and explore brackish estuaries in Florida up close as a volunteer for some research in college. I don't think it's a place that I would recommend to go and have a picnic necessarily, but I find them beautiful all the same. Swamps, bogs, and marshes are such unique, beneficial, and biodiverse ecosystems. They're home to thousands of plants and animals that can't live anywhere else. Lots of baby critters and migrating birds rely on the wetlands. On top of all that, wetlands also help to improve water quality all around. A hike through a swamp might sound like a crazy proposition to most people, but there's honestly a rhythm and beauty in the trees, reeds, and lilies. Just make sure you cover up, drink water, and use whatever kind of bug repellent that you believe in. 
I made some tiles to try out a few different ideas I had for glazing the, this piece. I tested a few different combinations of glazes, underglazes, and oxides. I ended up deciding on using a combination of the Mako Stroke and Coat Irish Luck and Green Thumb for the plants, and my hand mixed floating chrome over a layer of Mako Fundamentals Black Underglaze. I also used some white Stroke and Coat for the teeth and a bit of pink for the mouth and some like hand mixed creamy kind of color on the underside. For the plant carvings, I applied a thick double coat and then wiped back with a damp sponge to get clean edges on the carvings. This pot honestly looks fantastic. My one critique for myself is that the bottom bowed down a bit in the final firing. Future me knows that some clay nuggies under the midsection while drying and firing would fix this, but all in all, if the bottom of a pot's gonna bow at all, I'd rather it bow down like this one. At least when the bow is downward, it actually adds a little more space and helps direct drainage more effectively. So long as the wire holes are still functional, I'm not sweating a downward bow too much. Otherwise, the plant carvings look amazing, and the alligator is just as I envisioned him. All my glazes behaved as they should. Well, there's some chrome and sodium flashing here and there, but I think that's just a standard in my work at this point. I use so many glazes with chrome and sodium, they're almost always volatile to some extent in my firings. The two round toasty rings on the inside of the pot are from where I sat two little mame pots inside of this one for the glaze firing, because we do not waste kiln space around here. This pot was fun to make. I sent it over on its way to Evan Pardue in Louisiana to be planted up one day. I can't wait to see how the composition is completed. I'm pretty alright at making pots, but not so great at training and styling trees just yet. I'm thankful to get to work in collaboration with an artist who has a talent for the tree half of Bonsai. Evan, Carmen, and Mike all co-host the podcast Little Things for Bonsai People. I stumbled upon their podcast at just the right time and have been learning a lot about the horticultural details of taking care of bonsai trees from them. So you should totally go check out that podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you'd like to help support my channel, there are links below to my Patreon and my website, where you can donate or buy a pot respectively. If you'd like to stick around for a weekly art video, be sure to subscribe to my channel, Blue Nose Trading. Remember that you have great ideas that are worth exploring, drink lots of water, and I will see y'all next week.